Hey guys, Travis Gillespie here. We've been working with functions and graphing functions. This example wants us to graph the function described by the equation below. So we're going to use this equation to graph our function. But how can you graphically build a visualization of this function? Remember, a powerful tool for understanding or interpreting functions is to build a graph. It will allow us to see an overall picture or structure of, of what's happening with that function. So the first thing I want to do is create a table. So the first thing, let's create that table. My x values are going to come first. followed by my equation, negative x, minus 2. And I'm going to make sure I create just enough space so that we have an ordered pair at the end. Now it's not necessary to have, not all your teachers are going to make you create a column for your ordered pair, but I just think it's safe to have and it's a good habit to get into just for now until you get really comfortable with them. Now when generating ordered pairs, you get to create whatever x values you want. I like to keep the math simple, but I like to get an overall view of what my graph looks like or what my function looks like. So I'm going to start with negative 3. Negative 3, negative 2, negative 1. I'll use the value 0, positive 1, positive 2, and positive 3. Now I'm going to substitute all of my x values in for this x. I've got to pay special attention and be really careful with that negative sign that's already to the left of x. If I have a negative sign already to the left of x and I'm going to substitute a negative value in, I've got to make sure that that negative sign that's already up in the equation stays in place. Now I can use parentheses to plug this negative sign, uh, negative 3 in, in the parentheses. So negative 3 minus 2. And right now I'm just going to fill out the uh, entire column before we move forward. So now I have my negative sign, negative 2 in the parentheses, substituting that x, minus 2. Negative, negative 1, minus 2, negative 0, minus 2, negative, positive 1, minus 2, negative, positive 2, minus 2 and negative positive 3 minus 2. And let's go ahead and fix that 3 real quick. Now let's go ahead and I'm going to work this first problem out below. I'm going to use a different colored pen. So I have negative, and then in parentheses, negative 3, followed by minus 2 or subtracting 2 after that. Now what's going to happen with this negative sign outside of the parentheses and this negative sign inside of the parentheses? Now there's a couple of ways I can think about this. One way I can think about this is I have two negative symbols next to each other. So I could just slash and dash, which means just turn or rotate this negative sign on the outside of the parentheses vertically and lay it on top of that negative sign inside the parentheses. That's slash and dash, which means, hey, let's take this negative sign inside the parentheses, and if I were to move the remove the parentheses, then let's just slash and dash. I'm going to turn this negative sign inside the parentheses vertically and lay it on top of the one outside of the parentheses. Well, that just creates a positive sign. So I could have positive three take away Two. Well, let's just use this number line for a second over here. I don't even have to draw one up. This would be zero, and if I moved out to positive three, one, two, three. So here's positive three, and negative one, negative two, take away two. So here's negative two. Well, one way of thinking about this is asking myself, which value is further away from zero? Is it positive three or negative two? What's well, positive three? So is my number going to be more positive or is it gonna be more negative? It's going to be more positive. That's one way of thinking about this problem. And then you ask yourself, what's the difference between three and two? Well, the difference is one, but is it gonna be negative one or positive one? Since three is further away from zero, and we already said our answer is going to be more positive, one has to be a positive value. But there's another way of uh, doing this work. So this time, instead of drawing negative 2 on the, the number line there, let's just move out to positive 3 along this number line. So we've moved 1, 2, 3 out to positive 3. So from 0 to positive 3, we've moved out in this direction. Now I've got 2. U-turn and move in the opposite direction, back 2. So negative 1, negative 2, or take away 2. And I land at positive 1. 
as my stopping point. Therefore, when x is negative 3, y has to be positive 1. I'm going to use a red marker here, positive 1. And let's erase the information on the graph. I'm going to work through the other problems a little bit quicker and rewrite this. Now I'm going to erase this information below and let's get rid of that arrow as well. Now another way of thinking about this problem is to ask myself, Now there's another way of thinking about this problem. But I have to ask myself, I'm going to rewrite this as well. Negative x, negative x minus 2. I'm going to ask myself, what value could I place to the left of x to multiply by x to get the same value? or to get its identity. Well, that value would be 1 since um well, that value would be 1. When you multiply a value by 1, you get its identity. You get the same value. 1 times 1 is 1, 1 times 2 is 2. Or the reverse, negative 1 times 1 So what value can I multiply negative x by to get its, so what value could I multiply x by? Well in previous videos we found out that, well in previous videos we've discussed, well in previous videos we've discussed the identity property of multiplication. It states, you know what, if you multiply a number by 1, you get the identity of that number. So if I multiply 1 times 1, I get 1. If I multiply 1 times 2, I get 2. If I multiply 1 times 3, I get 3. The same holds true if I multiply 1 times x. 1 times x is x. But I don't have a positive x here, I have a negative x. So what can I multiply negative x by to get negative x. Well, I could still multiply it by 1. There could be a 1 hiding between this negative sign and the x. And if I were to multiply negative 1 times x, I would still get negative x. The same would hold true up, up above. I'm going to change pin colors. I could be I could reveal the one that's been removed that's in between this negative sign to the left and the negative 3 inside the parentheses. When I multiply negative 1 times negative 3, I have the same signs of two negative integers. When I multiply negative 1 times negative 3, well I have two integers that have the same signs being multiplied. Therefore the value is going to be positive. Negative 1 times negative 3 is positive 3. That will give you the same result as if you did the slash and dash method when you just rotated that 
negative sign inside the parentheses and laid it on top of this negative sign outside of the parentheses. So either way, it's going to take some practice. Whatever you like better, you can use it. I'm going to erase the information below and work through these next problems a little bit quicker. So negative, negative 2. Well, that's going to, I have two negative signs, so that's going to give me a positive. So I have positive 2 minus 2. Well, 2 minus 2 will give me a value of 0. So when x is negative 2, y is equal to 0. All right, here we have negative, negative 1, which becomes positive 1. Positive 1, take away 2, will give me a value of negative 1. <clears throat> One thing I would suggest before I move forward here is you give yourself a little extra room when working out problems like this so that you can write below these problems. So give yourself space so you can show your work and work through these problems so you get the correct y values. So you get the correct values for y. So now I have a 0. In the parentheses, it's neither negative nor positive. It's neutral. So regardless if there's a negative sign out here or not, it's still going to be 0 in the long run. Think about it. If I had negative 1 outside the parentheses and multiplied it by 0, my value would still be 0. So we have 0, take away 2. So the answer is going to be negative 2 in this case. Are you starting to see a pattern here? Yeah. It looks like my y value is decreasing by one unit each time. Okay, so this next one might be negative 3, but let's just work through the problem just in case. So now I have positive num So now I have positive numbers that are going inside of the parentheses. So what's going to happen here? Well, since I have a positive number inside the parentheses and a negative sign outside to the left, it looks like my number's just going to switch to being negative. So this is negative 1, take away 2. Well, a good visual you could, well, I could use the number line to work through this problem, or I could create a visual if I wanted to. I could create negative integer chips. So I have negative 1. And then I'm going to take away two more. So I'd put two more negative integer chips on the screen. So there are three negative integer chips total. Let's go ahead and erase this information. My value should be negative three since I have three negative integer chips below. Since I had three negative integer chips below. Since I had three negative integer chips below. Since I had three negative integer chips below. Hey guys, I just had a little bit of technical difficulty. I'm trying to get the screen back on on here. Um, I hope that's uh, not too much of a shift, but oh well, well, we'll work through this. So the last problem we found out, I had three negative integer chips on the screen. Therefore, the y value was negative 3. Let's move to the next one. I have negative 2, take away 2 more. That will give me a value of negative 4. And negative 3, take away 2, give me a value of negative 5. So let's go ahead and write these ordered pairs out over to the side. 
and I'm going to use a totally different pin color this time. So my x value starting out was negative 3, my y value is positive 1. When my x value is negative 2, y is 0. When x is negative 1, y is negative 1. When x is 0, y is negative 2. When x is 1, y is negative 3. When x is 2, when x is 2, y is negative 4. And when x is 3, y is negative 5. <clears throat> Okay, so let's look at this information really quick. Let's see if you see any patterns that, that uh, pull up. So let's look at this information real quick and see if we can find any patterns. Well, it looks like what's happening to the... So take a look at this information real quick. Take a look at what's happening between X and Y. So as your input or the X values increase, your outputs are decreasing, your y values are decreasing. Let's go ahead and take this information and plot it on this chart. Let's go ahead and take these ordered pairs and plot them on the coordinate plane here. Remember, remember we always start at the origin. Let's go ahead and take all this and let's go ahead and take these ordered pairs. Let's go ahead and use these ordered pairs to graph the function on this coordinate plane. So the first ordered pair is negative 3, positive 1. We always start at the origin. So I'm going to move in the x direction first, left or right, then the y direction second, up or down second. Get into the elevator before you move up or down in that elevator get into the elevator before you move up or down on that elevator. So starting at the origin, I'm going to move negative 1, negative 2, negative 3 units to the left, followed by 1 unit up. My y value is 1 unit up. Now take note real quick that I haven't numbered this coordinate plane. And that's okay as long it actually depends on your teacher. So find out what your teacher wants. But as long as each unit is only increasing or decreasing, but as long as I move along this coordinate plane, but as long as each unit or each move along the coordinate plane is only one unit or changes by a scale of one unit, I shouldn't have to order, I shouldn't have to number the order. I shouldn't have to I shouldn't have to number the coordinate plane. I shouldn't have to number the coordinate plane. Who's ever looking at the coordinate plane should be able to understand that each space is one unit or each move is one unit. The only time you should really number the coordinate plane is if you're changing by more or less than one unit between each space. Okay, so we've graphed the first ordered pair. Let's go ahead and plot the second point. Negative two, zero. So going back to the origin, start at the origin. You're going to move two units to the left in the x direction. One, two, and then your y value is zero, so it's actually going to land right here on the x-axis.
Okay, so, okay, so the next ordered pair is negative 1, negative 1. So now starting at the origin, I'm going to move negative 1 to the left, then down one unit. Okay, before I move forward to the next ordered pair, just know you only need two points to plot a straight line. However, I want this graph to be really accurate, so I'm going to get as many points on this coordinate plane as I can. So the next ordered pair is negative 1, negative 1. Let's go ahead and plot that. Start at the origin, move negative 1 to the left, followed by negative 1 in the y direction. The next ordered pair is 0, negative 2. So starting at the origin, my x value is 0. I'll move 0 units to the left or right, followed by a change in negative 2 in the y direction. So I'll move down 2 units in the y direction. All right, the next ordered pair is 1, negative 3. So this time my my x value is positive, I'll move one unit to the right. My y value is negative three, so I'll move three units down, one, two, and three. So my next ordered pair is two, negative four. Starting at the origin, I'm going to move two units to the right, then four units down, one, two, three, and four. And finally, my next value or ordered pair is 3, negative 5. Starting at the origin, I'll move out 3, 1, 2, and 3. Then move down 5, 1, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, and negative 5. Now I feel I have plenty of order... Now I feel I have plenty of... Now I think I have plenty of... Now I feel comfortable, I feel like I have enough points plotted on this graph. If you wanted more, you could definitely do so. You'd just have to add more x values to generate additional y values. But the last thing I want to do is draw a straight line through these points. So let's go ahead and see if this if I can get a straight line through there. And if not, then what I can do is go ahead and draw one on as best as possible. Now let's go ahead and see if I can get this line to be straight along these. So the goal is to draw as straight of a line passing through all of these points as possible. And you want arrows on both sides of your line. So we have arrows on both sides. And now you can see how powerful functions are. And now you can see how powerful graphing a function is. Whereas a table, it's limited. Whereas al although a table, it's good to have because you can visualize ordered pair. Whereas this table, 
it's good to have, but it's whereas this table whereas the table over here it's good to have, but it has its limits. You're only given a few whereas this table over here it's good to have, but but it has its limits. You're only given a few whereas this table over here it's good to have. However, it has its limits. You, you only have a few ordered pairs or a few points to look at. Whereas the graph, on the other hand, allows you to see all the points in between and all the points beyond what you've plotted on the coordinate plane. So a graph allows you to see all of the points. Remember when graphing you always move in the x direction first, y direction second. And if you plot correctly, you can you can watch the pattern continue on. Uh, it's all also it's probably good to note that to play it safe you probably want at least three numbers. I typically use at least one negative number, zero, and one positive number. That's to play it safe. However, the more points you can generate, the more accurate your graph can be. When you draw a line, it allows you to extrapolate more information. Regardless if you use a table or a coordinate plane, a graph. Functions allow you to see the corresponding y values associated with those x values. Functions allow you to see the corresponding y values that are that functions allow you to see the corresponding y values that are associated functions allow you to see the corresponding y values that are associated with an x value cool stuff guys i'll see you in another video